You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, November 29th, 2023, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Kara Santa Maria. Howdy. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Evan Bernstein. Good evening, everyone. What Basically, is? four old white guys and Kara. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so a, offended. <laughs> according to a recent email. <laughs> many, a many recent emails. Thanks, well, listener. You're not young people of color. That's correct. We, are, <laughs> no, no, we no, do not no. deny the fact. We are yeah, very open like, about the fact that we are There's a bunch lots of, of things I'm guys. not. <laughs> and I'm proud of it. Gal, yeah, get off my lawn! <laughs> <laughs> We're too old to do things like go into rock concerts, right, Evan? Oh, yeah, Evan! Or, right. Oh, no! Not only talk about fashion, but, right, nice but segue, not go to rock nice concerts. Segue. Go to metal rock concerts mm-hmm. because you might also risk <laughs> injury such as a distal biceps tendon rupture oh. in your in, in your left arm. And by oh you, goodness. you mean you. Yeah, that happened to me this past Saturday. That sucks. I was at a show and I'm in the crowd doing. You know, I've been I've been now to a hundred of these things yeah. in your recent years with Rachel, and you know, crowd surfing is a is a thing. It just is. It's it still a thing. Is. It's still a thing. It will. It'll, it just at every show there will be that occurring and i'll reach my arms up and pass the person over you know no issues no problems well that night somebody to my side who i just kind of caught out of the corner of my eye knows he was going down for the count sometimes you know people fall to the ground Mm. and there was absolutely like nobody there all of a sudden for some reason so i reached my arm out this guy was going to hit his head and and uh, and shoulders we're heading towards the ground i reached my hand out my left arm in order to help break his fall i caught him by like his shoulder blade but this guy was big, and he kind of took me down mm-hmm. with him. I didn't fall to the ground, but it, 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 it like hyperextended in a sense my arm, but stretched it out and snap. Oh. You know, you ruptured the ruptured the tendon, and I felt and, and I and I did feel a ter- absolute tearing sensation. I know why they call them tears now because that is precisely yes. the sensation <laughs> I felt. Was have you guys tearing? ever walked? Have you guys ever walked to a window? You pull down the shade, and you pull it a little bit too far. You let go, and the shade goes up. All the way up and flips around. That's yeah. what happened to Evan's bicep muscle. <laughs> yeah. So that's where it is. My bicep right now is entirely residing in the upper part of my left of my arm near my shoulder. Right. It's all yeah. bunched up kind of in this in this. Nasty can you way. bend the arm? Yeah. So Bob was asking me about what I can do with this arm right now, even though it's injured. Surprisingly, I can do just about everything with the arm and I'm not feeling pain in that sense only when i put but shouldn't he probably not be doing stuff with his arm right now i have what i'm calling full use of my arm with a few exceptions if i hold my hand out in front of me palm up like i'm ready to ask you for alms or something like that right alms for the poor and i can only hold so much weight in my hand in that position maybe maybe a couple of pounds anything heavier than that it will trigger the sensation and i I can't do it by comparison if i have my arm down by my side and I'm holding a grip or a, a you know a suitcase or a briefcase something like that no problem I can I feel nothing regardless of the weight obviously it's not yeah, that's all like working on that and, working on that tendon and deltoids is very little bicep work there so that make, that makes total sense but dude I I would be like knock me out and bring me into the hospital tell, wake me up when the surgery's done I would yeah. not want to have my arm next to me I, I don't know how you do it, man. It's t- that, that brav, bravo to you. Well, because no, I'm I'd not be, toughing I'd out the freaked. pain. I mean, really, I'm, it's it's not like I'm gritting my teeth and just you know rubbing dirt on it. Uh, I'm really not not sensing that that pain right now. Yeah, um, just the idea. except like, in bah. in that specific position. And my surgery is scheduled for Tuesday, December five. In fact, when I went in and they and they officially diagnosed because I went to the ER right after it happened, a couple hours afterwards, I'm like, I better go to the ER and check this out. I don't think this is good. <laughs> a couple hours. So, you finished the show first, didn't you? Hours. Yeah, we do. Well, yeah. We <laughs> oh my god! I'd be like, airlift me to the hospital. Oh god, now. Evan, you stayed till the end of the concert. Of course you did. Yeah, it, there was only there was only it like was a an good hour concert. left, anyways. And you know, and Rachel was in there. She actually, Rachel was doing photography for the show, so she was kind of working the show at the same time. Cool. Like, oh, you know, I mean, and I, I text I was texting with her what was happening. Uh, and she's like, "Well, do you need to go now?" I'm like, I, "I think I'm okay. We can wait for the end." So we left at the oh, end. But it was in New Jersey, so I actually drove back to Connecticut that night and went to my local uh, uh, emergency Whoa. room, 
went there. They, you know, put me through a few tests. They gave me an x-ray, make sure no bones were broken, mm-hmm. anything like that. Fine. But then they said, get to, you know, get to the specialist. We'll tell you where to go. Went to the, this was, and that was a Sunday. Monday comes, go to the specialist. He said, yeah, here's what you, here's what you got. We're going to confirm it with an MRI. MRI happened Tuesday, which was yesterday. And it confirmed it. And my, they already had my, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. With this particular injury, okay, they moved it to what they call STAT. And Steve, you know what STAT mm-hmm. means in, the, in this. Right, right and I, I tell you, they move, they, I've never, heard of like the bureau the bureaucratic nature of the system of that you know medicine and insurance and the whole thing is because you got to get approval for this i was not in within an hour of receiving that diagnosis okay i had the they had the mri scheduled for the next morning had the surgery they bumped someone else out of the place in line for surgery they put me in their place now i'm going on tuesday for the surgery and they already scheduled the first two post-surgical appointments for me. And they had all that done like within less than an hour. That was pretty darn impressive. Mm -hmm. But it also kind of showed the nature in this kind of injury. They have to get to it fast. Otherwise, there'll be complications um, the the longer that it goes. And, you know, in a matter of weeks, my arm will start to suffer some other problems if I don't get this done right away. I'm seeing some images here. It looks like there's two distal bicep tendons by the forearms. So So it's more complicated um, than I thought, obviously. Your recovery is going to be long, but how long are you in some sort of like sling or like how long are you immobilized? Uh, for a couple of weeks, Kara. I didn't say exactly. I guess they don't know for sure. It will not be a cast. They say it will be sling and or brace. I, I don't know what ultimately determines that. Uh, I guess I'll talk to them more about that next week and what they're going to do to me. And uh, I'll start physical. I guess I'll start the physical therapy, assuming the two appointments that come after the surgery which are scheduled within a week, a week later and a week later, if those go okay, then the physical therapy will start at that mm-hmm. point. And uh, this will take about three to four months to fully heal. Right, mm-hmm. right. And then and are you I back hope, and, to 100%? Uh, yeah, yeah. Then then I'll, I'll it'll be, in fact, in some ways, what he was describing to me, this, this particular procedure he's going to do, it's going to be better than it was before. No because, shit. Uh, uh, warning, I'm gonna, about to describe something medically mm-hmm. graphic. So, okay. So right plug ahead. your ears. Uh, they're going to drill holes, they said, through my, through the bone in my forearm. Mm-hmm. And they're going to tie, they're going to pull the stuff back through and tie it through the, through the holes in the bone. Whoa. Tie it off tight. And when it heals, right, when the bone heals and everything, it will cover, it will, it will make it even stronger, right? As yeah. it, as it covers, well, I gotta as get it this covers done. the tendon. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> I wonder, you, you don't want this. I wonder if that's because that there's very little tendon left on your your, your forearm, you know, your forearm bone. Because I remember reading about that. If there's if there's a little tendon left there at the, after the tear, they they stitch it together. But if there isn't any left, it was if it was mm-hmm. cleanly pulled off, then they'd have to sta- basically staple it. Um, this is a description I've read many years ago, so I'm sure. Yeah, these kind of surgical techniques evolve all the time. But this, yeah, this and, seems like an yeah. interesting. Yeah, it sounds like they so need to reattach advanced. it in a way that they know it won't fall back off. Yeah, better. So it's much much better than a staple. It seems that's cool. Yeah. They describe several different types of surgeries that they perform for this, Bob. So I imagine it it will de- it ultimately depends on what the R- MRI tells you. But he but my particular surgeon who's going to do this says he's seen the best success with this particular method so that's yep. what he's right yeah i'm reading about it. apparently they suture it to a to like a button that they put through the hole then the button is on the other side of the hole on the other side interesting will it be a metal button steve it, it'll be yeah, but it'll be a biocompatible maybe titanium i don't know Ooh, wow, interesting so i will have metal nuts. in my body that's yeah. nuts it's got to be mri uh-huh. compatible and it's got to be um biocompatible but yeah that's that's really interesting so that yeah, that you can... mechanism of injury is very common like Suddenly yeah. trying to brace somebody who's falling, especially if they're big. I see a lot of nurse. It's a very common nursing injury because, again, you're oh, taking wow. care of a big right. patient. They fall right, right. and you got to, you know, you got to catch them. You got to whatever. That causes a lot of injury. You got to always be very, very careful because you're I'm not gonna... in an advantageous position. You just threw your arm out. Like your arm right. took the whole weight of a big person. That's it's, right. Which it's funny you, you, how many like it's like an ACL tear in a soccer yeah. player. You know, it's like there's just like these injuries that people get over and over because of that kind of motion. It's interesting that they're so yeah. um common. I, I also think it's so fascinating how much like orthopedic surgery is just like carpentry. It's carpentry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> on like mm. body parts. It, yeah, I mean, or like plumbing, electrical. You know, it's just yeah, like... yeah. Neurologists are the electricians. You know, cardiologists <laughs> are the plumbers. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the or the penis are the carpenters. Yeah. yeah. It's rare that you hear, you know, such a good outcome for something that seems like such a major injury. Yeah. Evan, yeah. I'm, Evan, I'm sure I'm, from pictures I saw, I'm sure you probably have a lot of black and blue because the, the arm that I saw was crazy black and blue. Yeah, um, I'm looking at it right now, Bob, and there is there is surprisingly very little black wow. and blue. There's wow, kind of I wonder this if you had this super clean injury. Mm. It was pretty, yeah, I suppose yeah. it was pretty clean in in that sense. So, no, and there's no, like, external swelling or, or really anything. I felt no neurological. You know, they put me through a battery of pushing, pulling, you know, asking me all about different sensations I am having or had. And no, nothing, nothing like that. So I'm, you know, fortunate, I suppose, uh, in that regard, mm. <laughs> in that regard. One thing I'll, I will say to sort of to put a bow on this, <laughs> you guys remember at Nauticon? Mm-hmm. Okay. We each had to submit some facts about ourselves. Oh, you know, yeah. things that things that um, oh yeah, that never had no one in the audience or, or certainly anybody else <laughs> among us would know about each other. It's oh, a fun no. little game we played. What was what was one of my fun facts that turned? Yeah, a, never had a surgery in my life. Oh yeah, never had anesthesia. Was, Your streak never. is over. Are you never. scared? Never, never a surgery to repair something. Right. Um. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess I suppose I suppose there's a bit of anxiety just mm-hmm. because. I have no clue, uh, no no frame of reference, right, from a personal standpoint on any of this. Mm-hmm. So it's all new. Like I had my first MRI yesterday. Mm-hmm. I've had X-rays before, but yeah, that was my that was my first time. In, in did an you MRI. get did you get claustrophobia? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I, I thought it was going to be more like more coffin like, mm-hmm. but instead, it's more like an enormous circular disc that you get moved underneath. And and but I but there was. But it was open to the to the left and the right of me, so I didn't. Oh, so have you were in an open MRI. Enclosure. That was an open MRI. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's an open easier. MRI. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, because the non-open ones are very coffin-like. So yeah. that yeah, I was definitely not in a coffin. So yeah, very I, that no problem there. Yeah, I, I I I think if I were in that coffin one, that would have been a little bit disconcerting. Mm-hmm. I have I have this uh, little bit of fear about loss of mobility of my arm, <laughs> of my of arms of all, of all of all things. Right? If you if you you know you feel you can't. Help yourself if you needed to, if it's a helpless feeling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was all the way head first in an MRI scan for an hour and a half. You're shoulder Oof. to shoulder in that thing. You can't move. And at some point, you realize if something happened, I am completely helpless. Like, there's oh no way I could get myself out of this thing. Well, they gave me an emergency button to shut down the procedure. They handed, they yeah. put into my right hand a, a kill switch or something. They said, press this button if, you, if you're feeling any. You they know, call that the coward wrong. switch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't press it. Well, Evan, a little trick that I learned, you know, I had my first surgery last year and it was I was scared of anesthesia for sure. And I well, I had two surgeries. Little trick I learned is you can always ask for the so part of the cocktail they give you when you go under is anxiety medicine. It's part of it. Mm-hmm. It's a different, you know, different cocktails have different ones. Mine was Versed. But you can always ask to get that a little early. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And so if you're at the hospital and you're feeling really anxious, you can say, can you uh, help me with this a little early? Yeah, pre-game it a little okay. bit. Yeah. Pre-game it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. They are going to put my arm to sleep before they put me to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're going to deaden my arm. And it's going to, and that, whatever they use for that is going to last up about 24 hours yeah. of my arm being. 24. Wow. They're just going to give you a block and your just arm's going to be completely. Yeah. Numb. Like yeah. an epidural, yeah. but up for your arm. Be- yeah. They, they said that, I guess, I, I don't know, even for people who are under, they can involuntarily move a limb if they don't secure it that way. Oh, Is that right? smart. Yeah, you definitely well, at least don't you know you really won't surgery. feel anything. So that's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you said, you said you won't feel a darn thing until that starts to fade. And then, but you'll, you know, he said you'll want your painkillers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Let's, you know, I'm, I'm hope pain's different for everybody. It so, is. Um, let's... And there are Let's non-opiate see. Again, that'll, approaches. I have no way yeah. to know. I have no surgical experience about pain at all. Yeah. So. Also, yeah. I'm sure the doctor will tell you, but I, I had the upper one of the upper tendons of my bicep moved, so it was kind of like detached and reattached. And the guy's like, "All right, Bob. After a, a week or so, your bicep's going to feel fine, but don't lift anything heavier than a can of soda because mm-hmm. he's had pa- he's had patients he's had patients that that felt good and they did stupid stuff." And the tour, the tendon tour, which means that – so one of the tendons detaches. There's two up by your shoulder, and one of them detaches. And the doctor said to me, he's like, Bob, 
if you tear it, I'm not going back in. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, okay. I'll follow the instructions. Yeah. yeah. Right. Whatever, whatever instructions I am given, yeah, don't I, mess I with will that. abide by. Yeah. Can you imagine yeah. if that happened to you like before the 20th century, like before modern medicine? That's it. You just you just you, you you have to live, live the rest it. of your life that way. Yeah. There it is, and all. Yeah, and and, that, and yeah, and they said, yeah, untr- untreated, or if they didn't fix this, people can lose about 40 percent of the strength and and mobility and other things related to the arm. Over, mm. over time. And Devin, you will not be on the show next week, just so people are aware. Obviously, we're yeah, not going to make you yes. do the show. No, the we're going to make him record surgery. from the hospital. What are you talking <laughs> <Yeah>. about? <laughs> right all up. Evan. No, like they send me home same same day. They're sending yeah. me home. I'm, yeah. I'm not oh, having wow. it even at a hospital. It's a uh, it's just an ortho facility that handles uh, oh, wow. surgeries. Oh, yeah, yeah. neat. Yeah. Is this your yeah. dominant arm? No, no. Not, thank, yeah, thank, oh, you're so good. lucky. Thank you. I'll tell you what, of my five extremities off of my torso, I'm happy. <laughs> of all of them, it was this one. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one you would the choose, one, right? Your non-dominant that, arm. My, your left arm, absolutely. My legs I need, and my right arm I need, my head I need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the head is technically an extremity, but yeah. I, <laughs> I know. It took yeah. me a second to be like, what five is he referring uh, oh, to? That, <laughs> I meant, I I meant head, six. Okay. You, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you, you, could be, you could think of something else there for the fifth one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Still, I would put the left arm as the number one, but <laughs> yep. the non-dominant yes. arm. Okay, let's move on. So, guys, I have a question for you. Kara, I know you know the answer to this, but for everyone else. <laughs> okay, I want to answer. There's a major study looking at the association between internet use over the last 20 years and mental health. Mm-hmm. What would you guys guess is sort of the bottom line of this study? Has there been any effect one way or the other? on either just general mental well-being or specifically like mental health, like anxiety and depression that correlates with internet use or mobile technology? What do you think? I didn't read any article. This is a total guess, but I mean, I've been, I I really firmly believe that there is an increase in at least depression, but probably anxiety as well with the increase in uh, internet use. Have you have any thoughts? Uh, I would agree with Jay on that. Um, however, if I'm wrong, then I wouldn't also I would not necessarily be surprised. So that's the conventional wisdom. So let's let's take a look at at the actual data. So leading up to this study, I like this study because and this question because again it reinforces this notion that there's a lot of different ways to slice up data. There's a lot of different ways to address a question like this, and it's good to think about. We go and go from that general question to a specific research question, right? So, for example, are we talking about at the individual level, like for an individual person, does internet use correlate with any negative health outcome, mental health outcome? Is that occur at any level of internet use? Only with internet addiction or excessive internet use? Does it does it depend upon any demographic? Like, does it only happen in young people, old people, more in women, more in men? Does it only happen in people with pre-existing problems or pre-existing, you know, psychological issues? And of course, if there is a correlation, what's the causation? Is it that people who are unhappy are using the internet more? Or is it because internet use makes them unhappy? Then you could also then go to population level data, right? Now you're not talking about like for individuals, just like has any measure of mental mental uh, health or, or mental well-being been changing over time with increased internet use, right? So you could look at it at the population level. So that's what this study was. This was actually a massive study. It was not a collection of new data. It was using existing databases, and it was just an analysis of that. Meta-analysis, though? No, it's not a meta-analysis. Meta, it's not, not it's meta. Not, look, it's not, it's not a, a meta-analysis combines studies. previous studies. This is just a study looking at existing data. They didn't collect any new data. They just, you ah. know, right. are database utilizing data. existing databases. So, for example, yeah. there's a database. Still, though, they should call it a meta-assessment. It's not a meta. <laughs> there's nothing meta about it. <laughs> it's just right? an analysis. So they used the Internet Users and Mobile Broadband Subscriptions databases in 168 different countries, and they used the Global Burden of Disease Survey from 2019 and the Gallup World Poll data. So right. So that's, those are the databases they went to. They said, all right, now can we correlate changes in Internet use with any of the, you know, the burden of disease or the, Glo- the Gallup World Poll data in terms of uh, well-being. They looked at the last 20 years. They broke it up into two studies. The first study looked at mental well-being, which they broke in down into three parts. 
So the, they used just an overall sense of well-being. Like, do you feel like, you know, what's your overall level of life satisfaction? Then also, like, how many positive experiences do you think you're having and how many negative experiences, right? And then they looked at them over time, like in the last 20 years, how has this data been changing? And then they also looked at it, compared countries to each other in terms of the like level of internet use and see how that correlates with any of those three measures, right? Then they, the second study, they did the same thing for mental illness, looking at depression, anxiety, and self-harm. Got it? So there's basically two different studies, well-being and mental illness, looking at it over the last 20 years and across 168 different countries, correlating it with the level of mobile technology and internet use as two separate variables. All right, I'll give you the bottom line, and then we'll get into some detail. The bottom line is they found nothing. Nothing they to found see here. Move on. No, <laughs> they found no correlation. First of all, if you look at over time, that you know there was no increase in mental illness, no real, you know, no decrease in mental well-being. On average. On average. It's important to note that this is on yep. average. And if you look at it across countries, there was no correlation between the level of internet use or mobile technology use and these variables. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't trends in the data, right? When we use the term trend, we mean that there there was an effect, but it was not significant. Yeah, it was like and, close to zero, right? Right. So what they, they used what's called a ROPE analysis, region of practical equivalence. And that's both statistical and practical, right? So that, that kind of combines a statistical uh, sense of like, you know, what is significant, but also like, is this actual difference mean anything in the real world, right? Uh, and, they, and essentially you decide, all right, within this range, this is essentially indistinguishable from zero effect. So you have to be outside this range, outside the region of practical equivalence in order to say that there is a significant effect. None of the effects were outside Not of the region one. of practical equivalence. So basically all of the trends were indistinguishable from zero. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. even the next, excessive internet Next news user. item. Well, no, they, so there is the excessive one is not part of this study, to clarify. That's individual level data. This is not looking at individual gotcha. level data. This is looking at population level data. So it is possible, it is completely possible that when you dive into individual level you know, data, that mm -hmm. there are effects here um, that are just averaging out and lost in the wash at the population level. Right. Right. But, but like it, if and, people are use some people are using it excessively, let's say, for example, yeah. and you're seeing a little bit of an uptick in depression, anxiety, and then other people that are using it like not at all. And you're seeing like a uh, more well-being that they would well, wash and, each other out. And also like there is some suggestion in the literature that like teenagers and young people might have some negative effects, but older people have positive effects. They feel more connected and more happy. And so that could average out. Now, I feel happy. It, it, <laughs> backing up a little bit, since you brought this up, Carol, say if you're looking at the rest of the data, right, the rest mm -hmm. of the studies, and now this is, Bob, where we get into meta-analyses of other yeah. studies, uh -huh. the, the results looking at all different kinds of research addressing this question are mixed. They're basically mixed and inconclusive. They're real, there are suggestions, but not anything that's really solid at this point, probably because there isn't any dramatic effect. The only ones that show like a potentially significant effect are ones that deal with internet addiction, with this excessive yeah. use. So, uh, which of course is included in this population level data, but you know, th it, that was not pulled out in any way. So, but let's look at some of the trends out of interest. Again, these are not, I have to emphasize, these are not significant uh, they, they're not. They're consistent with the null hypothesis. We can't reject the null. It, this is compatible with there being zero effect. But basically, over time, there's been an increase in both. This is all self-reported in both negative experiences and positive experiences. Both have increased, although negative experiences have increased more than positive experiences. And well-being has been pretty flat in terms of mental illness. The uh, anxiety, depression, and self-harm is pretty flat. There's like really no significant trends there. And then if you look between countries, like, you know, in terms of correlating it with internet use, 
there's no real uh, no real trends there either. There's, if anything, there's a little bit of a increase in well-being with with mobile technology, but not necessarily with internet use. So one of the points that the authors bring up again, this is this is all correlational population level data. There's no way you can infer cause and effect. There is no control of variables here. Uh, and in fact, there are so many confounding factors, including some pretty obvious confounding factors like socioeconomic status. Yeah, poverty, like it's very yeah. likely that access to the internet and mobile technology correlates with higher socioeconomic status, which correlates with better overall life satisfaction and well-being, right? 100%. So, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so you would think that internet wow. use correlates with with the, a positive outcome, and that may be masking a negative outcome. Yeah, it's like um, asking if having a dishwasher or a TV in your house correlates. Yeah, it makes it's you like, happy. Yeah, because we have money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the TV's not making you happy. The money <laughs> yeah. you have to buy that TV is yeah. what's making you happy. Um, right. <laughs> but, you, but the thing is, you just can't know. You just can't know. Right. But one thing we could say, so the, the authors, though, you know, backing up, they said, if there were a sig- clinically significant and statistically significant negative mental health effect of internet use. We should be seeing that in the data. You would think that over 20 years and looking at 168 countries that we would see, you know, mixed in with all the other effects, there would be this internet effect that we could pull out of the data that would show some negative effect. And we're just not seeing it. Again, we can't rule it out with this data because of the the potential that it's being hidden by something, you know, that, that it's hiding in a subpopulation that's being compensated for by other subpopulations, whatever. Uh, we, so we can't say that there's not for anybody, there isn't a negative effect to overusing the internet or whatever, but there isn't a societal level negative effect. Despite the, the common perception, like that anxiety and depression has been increasing in the last 20 years, it hasn't been. These things are really pretty flat over the last 20 years, which is kind of reassuring. You know, there's no major negative effect in this yeah. data. Wait, Steve, to clarify. Yeah. You're saying specifically being caused from the internet, but I mean, I've read research that says that COVID has increased anxiety and depression. Yeah, but that's pretty recent. This data is like going right up to 2020. So, Oh, yeah, that's right. It's 19, right? Yeah, yeah. 2019, 2020, you know, so it probably, oh, if there were an effect, yeah. it could have been missed by this study. Although mm-hmm. it says from 2005 to 2022, so it might show it at the Some tail end there, but it just didn't. It's not in this data. We're not seeing it. And maybe because it hasn't had time to filter through the, the uh, these databases yet. I don't know. So again, it's it's it, it, it's interesting that there is no major signal there. Uh, and again, it's it's really just asking that one level of question. The authors brought up another interesting point is that this, the, so this study looked at 2.4 million people. That's how many people were included in this study. So that's, you know, pretty robust, obviously. And they said they could do this because population level data exists uh, for these questions. They said, however, that yeah. in, individual level data also exists because the you know the big tech companies are capturing yep. a lot of information about every individual customer and they use that for marketing however they do not make it available for researchers and and they were saying that should really change because if they did make that data available for researchers you know anonymized to protect individual confidentiality etc then yeah, yeah. Uh, then they would be able to do these kinds of massive studies looking at individual levels, not just population levels. And so that's something that really should happen is, you know, the tech companies opening up their data to researchers, which is something that's not happening right now. So this is still an open question, and this is only looking at the data from one perspective, but it, but it's, you know, we, we do have to, I think, not just go with our gut reaction or instinct or conventional wisdom because it can be wrong. And this yeah. data, you know, is pretty strong argument to say, well, maybe it's not as much of a problem as we thought it was, or it's more balanced, it's more complicated. You know, it's not a, just a, it's not just a big net negative because we're not seeing that in this data. Right. So when we say people, I guess it is an important question. Are we talking about adults? Yeah. So, but that's the question. Oh, oh, I see here. One of the data sets was individuals age fifteen to eighty nine. So we mm-hmm. can't really make 
comments, at least based on this analysis. Not of young kids. Yeah, no. of how the internet's affecting an eight-year-old, for example. Right, right, right. right, right. And that may yeah. be different. That may be very different. Although, with one caveat, is that because mm. eight-year-olds in 2010, you know, were 18 in 2020 and would be captured in this data. Mm -hmm. So if they were being negatively affected in a way that persisted into late teens, we would have seen that later on in this data set. Right, right. Right. Um, right. Well, so, yeah. Being flat wrong on this topic doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I'm very happy to hear that it, the internet doesn't have that effect. I mean, I'd be curious to hear something more oh. directed at social media, but I think but this, is, this, is, this is a very... 2005, like, 2005, 2005, 2005 was the beginning of social media. You know? Yeah. I mean, look, this is, a, this is great news because it, it could have just as easily been doing the, the exact opposite. And I find it really interesting how many people out there think that the internet is having a very bad effect. But remember, there, there's, a, there's a massive negativity bias that people always think things are worse than they are. And part of that is that the media feeds on negative news because that drives clicks, you know? Yep. And that's, it may be, and we've talked about this in a couple of different contexts where like everyone thinks that like everything is bad except them, right? It's like, yeah, I'm doing fine, but I, I hear that everyone else is miserable, you know? So we, it yeah. gives us this false impression that things are a lot worse than they are, but it's all friend of a friend kind of hearsay kind of information. But we list, but we believe it, we internalize it, and we all think that we're the exception. You know, yeah. it's like people who think we talked about this recently. Yeah, all teachers are bad. Cause my kids' teachers are good, but I hear that other people's teachers are all bad, or whatever. Right. Fill in the blank with any professional. It, it's it's just a bias in the way we perceive information, receive information. You know, you know, it's a confirmation bias. It's a media sensationalism bias and it's good to be skeptical of that and it's good not to just go with the conventional wisdom gut feeling until you see data because the data often contradicts our naive you know conventional wisdom hey and you know steve it's also a healthy exercise here like yeah to everybody that's listening to this news item you know if you happen to have agreed with me and evan before we found out what the answer is you know, does it bother you that you were wrong or are you know, or do you, are you having a different emotional or intellectual response? Like analyze mm. it because I'll tell you like 20 years ago, I would not have liked to have been wrong. And yeah. right. Not, right now, like I, I honestly am happy that I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially it's good news in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is yeah, good right. news. It's positive it is. reinforcement. But, you know, but yeah. as skeptics, you know, this is just an example. Like we need to. You need to be change able to hear stuff data. like this, and you yeah. have to change your mind with the data because the data is the only thing that matters. Yeah. And changing your mind with the data is – that's like the first step. Like you have to do that. But I think a little bit harder because it requires not a reaction but an action is to suspend your belief until you see data. It is to say – you know, even though I feel this way, I honestly don't know because I've never seen any objective data on this and just not have an opinion about it until you do see data. That's harder to do. Yeah. All right, That's let's a, move on. Jay, yeah. tell us about capturing methane. Yeah, even though um, the release of CO2 is the main culprit in global warming, did you guys know that methane is actually worse? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked mm -hmm. about that. We talked about that. It's worse but shorter acting, so it's— right. It's hard to, to make one statement about it. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's a different set of awful problems. It's yeah. a different, you're right? It's a different thing. Um, it depends on the time frame you're talking about. It's worse over shorter time frames. Better, not as bad over longer time frames. Right. I'll give you all the details. Right. This will, the, when I'm done yeah. talking to you, you, you'll know more about methane than you ever wanted to. <laughs> um, so, it would be great to limit the release of methane. Um, it would be a very effective thing to do in the short term. Right. So, if we wanted to have some really quick short-term benefits or, you know, improvements in global warming, methane is actually a good place to spend some time and energy. Now, even though methane only lasts, now Steve was saying it's a short-term short, short -term thing, it lasts about 12 years in the atmosphere. It's not very long. Compared to CO2, CO2 lasts hundreds of years. You know, CO2 just doesn't quit. Um, so methane is more than 28 times as potent as a carbon dioxide, you know, greenhouse gas. Um, than than CO two though, so it is it is like worse as far as it traps heat better, much better than CO two. Uh, there's existing ways 
to limit methane release, right? You know, methane is is being used everywhere, right? You know, think of all the major cities, you know, like cities like New York. If you've ever been in an apartment building in New York, it smells it smells like natural gas in, in most apartment buildings because of methane, you know, release that they don't want, but it's a very difficult thing to fix. So we need to fix natural gas leaks. That's just a, a standard. We have to raise the bar on, you know, what we're willing to say is okay, like how much can be released per building or whatever they come up with. Like, you know, we need to do something about that, you know, because again, it's methane and natural gas are being used everywhere. They're all over the place. We, of course, need to get off our coal dependency. I'm not just saying that because we need to get the hell off of coal because coal produces CO2. The mining of coal releases methane, right? I mean, think about that. Like just to get coal releases a greenhouse greenhouse gas, even before we use the coal. It's like a double whammy. And then I know you guys know this, the meat and dairy industries, bad, very bad. You know, another huge source of methane because cows are essentially methane generating machines and meat and dairy both largely come from cows. So that's a big problem. You know, we have doing all these things would, would definitely go a long way to lowering methane emissions. And if we did all that, we could slow global warming. They're saying by 30% in the next 10 years specifically just by doing the things that I said in other um, methane mitigation. But basically, you know, those things that I itemized right there are big offenders. This is all backed by research, and that's that's not enough because all of that is considered the low-hanging fruit. This is the, actually the easy stuff to do as far as what the researchers are saying. We need to do a lot more than just that. That's because as the world warms, it will induce more methane to be released by mi- microbes that are currently right now, they're frozen in the permafrost. And when we lose the permafrost, first off, all of those frozen microbes are going to start generating methane. And all the microbes that are already in places that are unfrozen will be more active because of the temperature going up. We will have a, a huge surge in methane when that happens. And we have had a, a significant increase in methane since the industrial age. So right now, if we were to remove that methane from the atmosphere, let's say that we could snap our fingers and it happens, the planet would eventually cool by 0.5 degrees. That is not insignificant. That, yeah, is, yeah, that is a significant number. So obviously, what I'm, you know, all this data is saying, we need to, you know, countries around the world, we need to develop technology, we need to develop lots of different technologies. And in general, scientists want to develop several ways to remove methane directly from the air. This is a big challenge, though, and the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, are, they're currently working on this subject. They, you know, they're, they're definitely putting in time and energy to try to figure out some heavy-hitting solutions that we could then invest a lot of money into. Now, the main problem is that methane is a very strong and stable molecule. It doesn't change easily. It takes a lot of energy to change that molecule, to break it up. It's made up of one carbon atom, and there's four hydrogen atoms hanging off of that carbon atom. So the methane in the atmosphere, like we said, it doesn't last that long because energy from sunlight and highly reactive hydroxyl radicals can destroy methane molecules, and that is happening all the time. So methane molecules in our atmosphere is being destroyed, but we happen to be pu- you know, pumping in way more methane into the atmosphere than it is being destroyed. Now, in other settings, methane is much more difficult to get rid of. So microbes called methanotropes, the, they use enzymes and they actually eat methane. They, they use it as fuel. Microbes yeah. live in the soil and they eat up to about 30 million metric tons per year. Even though that's not insignificant, it's still 320 million tons less than we pumped into the atmosphere just in 2022. So, you know, human activity is in, insanely outstripping what nature is doing on its own to, to get rid of methane. Microbes called Methanogens that live in the soil produce methane faster than their methane-eating counterparts, right? So we have microbes that are eating it. We have microbes that are creating it. Microbiologists are trying to figure out if it's possible to get the methanotropes bacteria to eat more methane faster. So they want to genetically engineer these microbes to basically be much more effective at eating methane and getting rid of it and turning it into into other things. Yeah, CRISPR that shit. Yeah, right? But it's difficult, Bob. And, you know, and they don't really know... You know, sometimes they're just guessing and to see what happens. And one one of the researchers was saying that they really hope that they get lucky, you know, like the, that they stumble on 
you know, they stumble on something that they've modified that is very effective, but they don't, you know, they don't know. There's a, there's so much information that we don't have that we need to have in order to, to be better at altering the, these bacteria. Another issue is speed. So bacteria that eat methane, they typically are pretty slow moving. You know, and as the researchers figure out more about how these bacteria function, they'll be likely able to, you know, bend genetic engineering better so they can they can create bacteria that functionally do the job faster and better. And scientists are hopeful that we can we could get there sooner, which is great. You know, it'd be great if something happened within the next five years, say, where we, we actually came up with something that would, would have a, a real effect here. Now, another angle that they're coming at it uh, is from the chemistry side of things. So chemists are working on creating methane-destroying chemicals that can be put into reactors that are close to where methane is being created. Though there are hurdles that need to be overcome, currently high temperatures and very difficult conditions are required in order to do to destroy methane right now from a chemical perspective. And then there's also expensive components that we need, like platinum. Um, so our current technology, even though it functions, it's really expensive and it's not it's just not moving fast enough. And we we need to significantly improve, you know, that the technology that we have from a chemical perspective. Several researchers are working on catalysts that convert methane into other molecules. Now, in case you don't know, a catalyst is essentially it's something that can affect a molecule, but it doesn't change itself. Like it just does what it does and, it, and you're not really using up the catalyst. It just does. It its makes thing. a reaction go faster. Yeah. And, well, I mean, and by go faster, it could mean like it takes a million years or it takes a second, right? So it basically sometimes going faster means happening at all. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So one of these catalysts converts methane into methanol using high-energy ultraviolet light. And hey, methanol is actually a useful compound to have. So, you know, there might be bonuses to doing this, right? If we're going to be converting methane into other usable atoms or molecules, you know, whatever we can get out of it, like methanol is a great thing to have. It's, it has a ton of uses. Current, yeah, I love meth, man. Right, it's the best. Um, methanol right? can also make you go blind. Sure. Yeah, you couldn't <laughs> eat it. Is that what they were drinking when alcohol was prohibited? Uh, it might have been, yeah. Well, it might have been not intentionally, but yeah. Bathtub gin, produced. right? They were making, mm-hmm. uh, right. Uh, On a side note, even though there is significantly less methane in the atmosphere than CO two, in the short term, methane removal could show much more progress than removing CO two. So it could buy us really? some time, basically. Yes, yes, because in the in the short term, these the, all of these scientists pretty much agree that methane removal is probably like one of the first things that we should start to do. Now, listen wow. to this. Two out of every million air molecules are methane. 400 mm-hmm. out of every million air molecules are CO2. So there's a huge difference in the amount of methane and CO2 in the atmosphere. So, you know, look, there, the good news is that researchers are hopeful. There's lots of different researchers that are go- coming at this in multiple different ways. This is exactly what we want to have happen. But we've got to pump a lot of more, a lot of more. A lot more money into this, much, much more money than we are right now. Uh, we basically c- uh, collectively emit 570 million tons of methane into the atmosphere every year. The world does, right? 570. And methanotrophic bacteria consume 30 million mm-hmm. metric tons. So 30 compared to 570. So basically, we just need to make enough of these bacteria to like have about an order of magnitude increase in the amount of methane that they're consuming. I don't know how plausible that is or how much it would have to be. I mean, what we, we do just have vast lakes and just of the bacteria. I mean, what, how would you practically do that? Yeah, I don't know how, you know, I, I, I did not get any understanding on how they would create them and then distribute them and infuse them into the yeah. environment. You know, there was, a, there was a couple methods that I read about that I really didn't like. And even the scientists were saying like, look, we are essentially – throwing ideas at the wall. Yeah. They're just like, let's just make the bacteria first and then see, figure out how to use them. But I think the figuring out how to use them thing might be a bigger problem. Yeah, you know, but they were just... they, they came up with this method, Steve, where they were like, we could take chloride and we could put it into onto the surface of the ocean in certain areas. And that would have an effect on uh, methane production. And then the scientists said, basically in the same sentence, but... We're also pretty sure that if we did that, there would be other sideline effects that might increase CO2, right? It's complicated yeah. because, you know, think about it, when you're yeah. talking about, you know, changing an environment like that. So, you know, there's lots of different things that they're they're talking about right now. And a lot of, 
you know, there's a lot of peer uh, review going on where you have other scientists saying, no, 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 we can't do that yeah. because of X, Y, and Z. But this is this is science, right? And and at least it's happening. But it's important to note, you know, with existing technologies, we can significantly reduce the anthropogenic release of methane into the atmosphere, right? A lot of it's natural, but a lot of it is anthropogenic. And so that part can be significantly reduced with existing technologies. We just have to do it. For example, release of methane from cows is not inevitable. That's based on their diet. And if we just fed them a different food, they, you could have essentially methane-neutral cows, dairy and meat farming. Part of it is like feeding them on on grass grown in soil that has methanotrophic bacteria in it. They get methanotrophic bacteria in their gut, and it eats all the methane before it gets excreted. So there are lots of things like that that we could be doing. And if we if we do this, it could, it could buy us t- a significant amount of time in terms of reducing the pace of global warming. So, you know, to give us the time to reduce the CO2 emissions and do some more significant carbon capture. All right. Thanks, Jay. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about one of our sponsors this week, Aura Frames. Aura is the Wi-Fi connected digital picture frame that beautifully showcases your photos and videos. You can add unlimited photos straight from your phone using their app. It's very easy. I did it just last month and it was simple and quick. The frames are designed to be super easy to use because we want anyone to be able to enjoy them, even dads who still have flip phones. Oh, my God. <laughs> Truth be told, Aura is the perfect gift for any occasion. We're talking Christmas, Hanukkah, birthdays, anniversaries, thank you presents. Each frame comes packaged in a premium gift box with no price tag. <laughs> It also helps you stay connected with family and friends, even when you can't all be together. Yeah, I've been using one. We all, we think we all got one and uh, the pictures are awesome. Very easy to use. What I love is that you have all these photos on your computer, on your phone, whatever that you never look at. Mm -hmm. Now you just load the whole folder up, you know, onto your Aura frame and there they are. Now you're, you're looking at all of your photos. Visit AuraFrames.com slash skeptics today and get $30 off their best-selling frames. These frames sell out quickly, though, so get yours before they're gone. That's A-U-R-A frames dot com slash skeptics. Use promo code skeptics to get $30 off their best-selling frame. Terms and conditions apply. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. Kara, yeah. w- will revenge make me happy? We're going to be talking about sweet revenge, bittersweet mm-hmm. revenge, bitter revenge. I found a cool article, cool, I found an interesting article uh, that was written by a psychologist. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of new research in it, so I tried to do some digging on my own, and I found some things that are like kind of up to date, but it, she was posing an interesting question, which is, is revenge sweet, you know, like... When we, Satisfying? Yeah, like when we seek revenge, when we engage in revenge behaviors, is it helpful? Is it satisfying? Does it restore justice? Does it make us feel better? Um, You know, all the different questions that we could ask. And I don't know. I thought it was a pretty interesting kind of question to grapple with. So I'm just curious what you guys think. Um, It's complicated. I mean, I mm. I've wanted to enact revenge on several people in my life. And I (laughs) always choose. I choose not to. One, because, you know, I was very lucky. You know, I think if you spread around that negativity, you're just making the world a darker place. I don't know. It's it's difficult, Kara. Like I, I personally try to avoid revenge in my life. But I think some people deserve revenge. Well, I think with revenge, there comes this sort of idea of sort of taking the law into your own hands. And mm. there's, there's, a, there, there's a sense of wrongness that accompanies that just inherently. So I think that, that may give lots of people maybe pause to maybe thinking in a direction that would be defined as revenge. Yeah, and I think yeah. that, yeah, those operational definitions differ. I think it's much more fun and rewarding to think about it than actually do it. Interesting. Okay, that's a yeah. point I want to come back to. Because yeah. I think fantasizing something... about a revenge may be satisfying, but actually doing it, I think nurturing those kind of negative emotions always are going to be more harmful to you. You know, here's something. There's something pretty interesting about what what the two of you just said that I want to come back to. But before I do, I, I like the point that you guys made about sort of the word even revenge and what we think of. It's revenge about breaking the law. Is it about taking the law into your own hands? Does it involve criminal activity? And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, the the psychologist who wrote this article dug a little bit into the um, 
uh, etymology of the word. And so the root of revenge is vindicare, with the Latin root, Vindicate. which is also the root of vin vindication or vindictive. Um, and it's interesting because we often think of revenge as the desire to like re retaliate, um, like to inflict harm or punishment after somebody was wronged. Vindication, sometimes we think of as having a different layer, which is like clearing your name or proving your innocence. Mm. And then there's words like retaliation, retribution, but they all kind of have some overlapping uh, feelings in at least in I guess American English I don't know if, if I can speak to other other forms and you know there are a lot of different ways that people could seek revenge so there's one I guess interesting question to, is does it work to restore justice another one is is it cathartic you know does it actually feel good to engage in or to seek revenge and I think that that many of you brought up an important point, which is, is there a difference between thinking about or plotting the revenge and then actually engaging in the revenge behaviors? And so there have been several studies on this. Some of them have been experimental in nature. Some have been more observational. One that I want to reference talks about sort of the steps involved in revenge. So, so this one, they specifically point to what I just did, which is that the motivation behind revenge is often about injustice, like feeling like there was an injustice that was perpetrated or feeling betrayed or emotionally hurt. And usually there's like a three-step process. There's the planning process, the expectation phase, and then the execution phase. Execution phase where you kill them? <laughs> I guess that would be the extreme. Uh -huh. That would be the executory execution. Yeah, the extreme <laughs> version of that. But also, it could be a simple act of revenge that's actually not against the law. It could be a prank, right? Like something that's perfectly legal and above board. Often during the planning, there's quite a bit of almost like kind of borderline obsession over the wrong that's been perpetrated and like, how am I going to pay them back? What am I going to do? And then the plan starts to come together. And sometimes people feel empowered during that point. They might even feel satisfied. And then they in might engage in the actual revenge behavior, which is sort of all over the place. But Basically, the big takeaway is kind of like with your um, your topic, uh, Steve. There's sort of a bottom line, and then there's caveats and and little interesting nuggets. Basically, overall, revenge seems to be bitter. It mm -hmm. does not seem to be sweet. And actually, the point that you guys made previously about how the planning might be healthy or good for you and make you feel better, but then the executing might be the opposite, is actually reversed. So. Really? When we think about revenge a lot, it actually amplifies the transgression. Mm -hmm. So somebody slights you or hmm. wrongs you, and then you start obsessing over that wrong. It makes it bigger and have more weight. And it actually can affect your well-being and your mood more negatively. It impacts you more negatively. So the longer that you sort of ruminate on that, the more negative uh, mental health consequences it has. So my takeaway is that you enact your revenge as soon as possible. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Before it festers into something worse. Right. And, so, awesome. and then the interesting thing is that the execution of the revenge, right, the actual behavior, can momentarily feel really good. And there have uh, actually dopamine. been... Yeah, there have actually been studies like MRI studies where people, you know, kind of watched different um, revenge behaviors, different scenarios, and they would see some people doing something fair and some people doing something unfair. And I could kind of go through the paradigm. It's about like a, it's a money sharing game. These are quite common in psychology where like one person starts with $10 and then the second person, he's like, I could give you all of the money. And if I give you all the money, then they're going to double it. And then if you give it back to me, we'll both have more money. But they all have to agree. So sometimes the first person's like, I don't trust you. So they just keep <laughs> the $10 and nobody makes any money. And sometimes the second person's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And so the, the first person gives the second person the money. And now the second person has all the money and doesn't give the other half back to the first person. So this, this is a <laughs> common <money>? paradigm. <laughs> yeah, because it shows like, it shows like a sense of justice and fairness and betrayal and all of those things. And in MRI studies, they've shown that people who watch revenge seeking actually feel a sense of satisfaction and they actually get like a little kind of positive experience out of it interestingly that's more common in men oh. yeah i totally yeah. buy that 
I mean, that, that's that's why a lot of movie plots are based upon that. They set up a bad guy so that the good guy can get revenge upon them, and everyone feels good. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It has to be a satisfying ending. But most, but 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 let me be clear. Most studies show that that cathartic effect of revenge, that like, ha ha, I got mine, is largely false. What, what do people time, feel when they get revenge? What, what do they, they feel, feel? Either nothing, or they just kind of feel shitty, like they did before they got their revenge. Yeah. Sort of sad to have been put in a position yeah. in which they had to be feel that in the first place, right? Because their compli- their emotions are complicated. It's like the same story we often see when we watch these harrowing or these kind of really maybe not harrowing, but these these really dark films, documentary films about you know a family member is murdered and then they try to figure out who did it and then that person goes on trial and then the family members sometimes get a sense of satisfaction seeing that person go away but often you'll see at least a handful of members of the family saying don't put them to death like that doesn't like two people are going to be dead then yeah. so you'll you'll often see that there's like this empathy layer to it that makes it complicated. And so the study that I was mentioning before where we saw um, men have a slightly different response. So when there were fair players, like when they would give the money back in a fair way, both men and women reacted positively. And you saw more um, indication of empathy, both in brain activity and also in self-report. But when the bad guy got shocked women, even if they disapproved of him, were still empathic towards him and felt bad for him, but men weren't. Their reward centers were activated. So that's kind women of like bad boys, right? <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> or women are socialized to be more empathetic and yeah. to yeah, they they practice empathy more because they're raised to do it more. Mm-hmm. And men are socialized to kind of view things in that sort of way. But this is only one study. Most studies just show that people kind of feel like shit after or they don't feel anything Mm -hmm. at all. Um, Mm -hmm. And that during the lead up, it actually just makes whatever slight or whatever betrayal Mm -hmm. was was experienced magnified and amplified and that much worse. So even though it is bittersweet, sometimes people do get a little hit of dopamine after, but it doesn't seem to last. So, Kara, what you're saying is that Khan should have forgiven Kirk. Sure. Mm. Catch with all this is <laughs> leaking. Well, who and who? That's one of the takeaways that I see across almost all of these studies is that the long term effects of getting retaliation or getting revenge is not a relief of these emotions, but usually more of like a vicious cycle, uh, an amplification of the actual first um, slight. They might get short term satisfaction, but then the conflict usually escalates. It can lead to a big back and forth where it's like a revenge spiral. Mm-hmm. It can hinder healing. And it can lead to increased isolation and loneliness. So a lot of the kind of psychological um, tools that are usually offered for helping, you know, what do you do in a case where you're trying to seek revenge or where you, you've been aggrieved is work on yourself, work on your goals, and try to move forward. Like use these experiences as opportunities for resolving conflict as opportunities to practice gratitude and forgiveness or, you know, go through the legal system to ensure that if we are talking about, obviously, a a terrible crime that was committed, uh, utilizing the system in front of you, which I know is not perfect and which I know this is this can also be caveated a thousand ways because we all know that victims, for example, of sexual violence are not vindicated the way that they they should be, especially in our society. But going through um, a legal system where individuals, you know, are actually put to trial and potentially um, found guilty of a crime and justice is ensured in a way that's sort of codified in the law can actually bring some of that comfort to victims. Yeah. Pointing out that Steve said it, Jay, you alluded to it. We have this Hollywood version of, Mm -hmm. of revenge that, you know, is, it's not reality. Mm-hmm. It's not really the way real life plays out, obviously, in the way, you know, you want the character to have that have that sort of victory in the end. But is he really experiencing, you know, euphoria or, you know, a sense of a sense of, you know, feeling better about it all? No, yeah. you know, 
surprise, Hollywood is not reality. So we're we're can, we're kind of conditioned also by it in a, to a degree. Oh, 100%. Yeah, mm, yeah. yeah it's it's just like a, a, an on-screen death is never exactly what or it, you know, we're close to what, you know, death looks like in reality. It's um yeah. we have this fantastic version of it and I think we have made it and, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of cultural reasons that we've moralized revenge because they're like biblical reasons, right? There are things that people read in scripture that that reinforce the concept of revenge. Uh, it's in Exodus, right? We think of like, what's it called? Is it Hammurabi's Code? The eye for that an eye, tooth right. for a tooth? Does that oh. sound right? That sounds right, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, but then you also hear like Gandhi said, like an eye for an eye leaves the world blind. Yeah. You know? And so like mm-hmm. th- it, there is a kind of a moralism that that comes into play. And I think that Hollywood does not do a good job of helping with that because Hollywood portrays a moralistic view of revenge. Like, Oh, when the guy who was slighted finally gets revenge, then all of a sudden he's, he is sort of the hero, mm-hmm. right? Like he, he seeks yeah. revenge his whole life and then he finally gets it. And now he's the hero and we all are very proud of him. And I don't think that that message is a healthy message. I no. think it perpetuates a some of these misogynistic stereotypes that probably reinforce what they found in that one study. But b it's it's a false narrative, and then you go and you go, why don't I feel anybody? I actually feel worse. This sucks. Yeah, but it was really cool when he said, <laughs> <laughs> "I am in Digo Montoya. You killed my killed father. Pretty terrible." Pre- <laughs> but but the music cool. was reaching this crescendo in the yeah, background. Right. It made me feel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but Steve, that plays into what Kara was saying in that scene. It's quite anticlimactic because he just, the six fingered guy, just runs away. Like, well, didn't see that happen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, plus, you know, and Ego, like, said, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life now. Like, he, he ruined He lived sense, for revenge. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, true. Good well, call. He, he does the, become the, the Dread Pirate Robert, it, but yeah. still, yeah. the point is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> revenge, revenge will do more damage to you, I think, than good. Yeah, but it is a dish best served cold. <laughs> <laughs> it may be more effective, but not better for you. That's true. <laughs> All right, Bob, tell us about underground microbes. Oh yeah, uh, this one was really cool. A recent study described the results of examining genetic data of microbes deep under the earth, and the results are not only fascinating but also have implications for dealing with climate change and potential life on Mars. This is from the journal Environmental Microbiology, and uh, they have accepted this study from researchers at Northern Northwestern University in Illinois, including study lead geoscientist Magdalena Osborne. Okay, so you probably don't give too much thought to microbes deep under the ground, but I do. We know so little, but there's little doubt that there's one hell of a popular place down there for bacteria and archaea. Uh, They're just hanging out and doing their thing. Um, And if if you just weighed the microbial biomass in the crust, it would certainly outweigh every living thing in the oceans. And far far below us is clearly one of the largest biomes on the planet. Um, But it's obviously, right, far harder to figure out who and what's happening deep underground compared to the oceans. You know, the ocean's not easy. But, I mean, underground is far worse. Um, so th- this paucity of information about life deep underground, that's it's why it's often colloquially referred to as microbial dark matter. And I love that term the moment I heard it, microbial dark matter. Um, so this is where an old gold mine comes in. Um, the old Homestake Mine in South Dakota is now called the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And, of course, the acronym is SURF. So uh, lots of different research happens at SURF. Uh, there's lots of experiments that take place down there, including physics-based uh, research um, and experiments. But there's six areas throughout this, this mine, throughout this SURF, that are collectively called the Deep Mine Microbial Observatory. So now it, and it's from these various sections and depths of the mine where the researchers took their samples and basically studied the crap out of them. Um, the samples consisted of rock fracture fluids, which was essentially water and dissolved gases, plus, of course, microbial life. They say that many of these fluids are over 10,000 years old, and they have been isolated from any surface contact. Jay, you haven't had contact with them, right? Not yet. Thank you. <laughs> not yet. Uh, so not yet. That hopefulness. So, <laughs> so from, from these samples, they created... Here comes another scientific acronym, MAGS, M-A-G-S, and that stands for Metagenome Assembled Genomes. 
So that means that they sequenced all the genetic data from the microbial communities. So that means that they sequenced all the genetic data from the microbial communities. That's the metagenome. And then they computationally reconstructed the individual microbial genomes from that, right? So it's like if the five of us were mushed together into this gross slurry of skin and organs and stuff, Mm-mm. and scientists – keep stay with me – and scientists <laughs> distilled from all that all of our genetic data. That would be our SGU metagenome. And then inferring from that each of our own individual genomes. That wow. would be our that would be our mags, our metagenome assembled genomes. Okay? Good example? Good. So from <laughs> this, the researchers get this surprisingly impressive handle on the microbial communities and, and the members, like their various functional possibilities, the diversity. Um, they can the scientists can characterize the metabolic pathways. Um, evolutionary relationships, and more. They get this wealth of, of this data that they can, this information that they can infer just from this, just from the, the gen- genetic detritus, really, that's, that's in this water and dissolved gases. In the study, in this specific study, they identified 600 uh, genomes um, in various stages of completeness. You know, some of them, a bunch of them were like over 90% complete. Uh, some, you know, and then another chunk was you know, 40 to 70 percent complete and all that stuff. Um, and uh, those of those 600, uh, they were the microbes were part of 50 phyla and 18 candidate phyla. Now, it's one of the one of their big takeaways was that all of these lineages that they looked at can be characterized as minimalist or maximalist. So the, I'll let the paper describe uh, what these what these terms mean in this context. They said, many of the microbes we found were either minimalist, ultra streamlined with one job that it does very well alongside close consortium of collaborators, or it can do a little bit of everything. These maximalists are ready for every resource that comes along. If there's an opportunity to make some energy or transform a biomolecule, it's prepared. By looking at its genome, we can tell it has many options. If nutrients are scarce, it can just make its own. Okay, so now how uh, the maximalists were fascinating, right? It seems like they like a lot those abilities can be used in industry. I mean, it seems like amazingly versatile. The minimalists are interesting as well. Imagine this: these various lineages are hyper specialized, right? They they share a lot. Some of them even shock the scientists. For example, uh, team lead Osborne said some of these lineages don't even have genes to make their own lipids. Which blows wow. my mind because how could you make a cell without lipids? It's sort of like right. how humans can't make every amino acid, the, the paper continues. So we eat protein to get the amino acids that we cannot make on our own. But this is on a more extreme scale. The minimalists are extreme specialists and all together they make it work. It's a lot of sharing and no duplicate, duplication of effort. Okay, that's where the quote ends. So some of the implications of such underground uh, microbial communities really caught my attention. The researchers note that since they live exclusively underground within rocks and water and they've got no contact with the surface, they could give us clues as to what could survive deep within other planets, right? Like Mars or icy moons in our in our solar system. If we when we eventually really look at those planets and those moons, we may find these minimalists and and maximalists as well. The implications back on Earth, though, could also be quite important. For example, Steve, we talked a lot about long-term carbon storage, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's becoming increasingly urgent to mitigate climate change. A lot of companies are looking to injecting carbon dioxide deep into the Earth. So it's another quote from Osborne. She said, we need to be cognizant of life in the deep subsurface and how human activity like mining and carbon storage could affect it. If we store carbon dioxide underground, microbes, microbes could metabolize it and make methane, for example. Jay, um, there's a biosphere underground that, depending on how it's perturbed, has the potential to affect the surface. So imagine, you know, you inject a lot of carbon dioxide. Yeah, we're doing some long-term carbon storage. And the microbes like, OK, we've got a new, we got a new uh, resource here. Let's make methane. Like, holy crap, that's not, that would not be good. I'll end with a quote from that scene at the end of Incredibles. The Incredibles. <laughs> the mole man comes from the underground. Oh, yeah. I and he says, that. behold, the underminer. I'm always beneath you, but nothing is beneath me. Oh, man, I love that. I hereby <laughs> declare war on peace and happiness. So if they ever reboot that movie, I think they should have creepy microbes oozing out from underground <laughs> instead of the underminer. So that's it. All right. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> 
Sure, Steve. But one thing is for sure, we won't be reading about that story in Pop Psy magazine. Ah! Oh, oh God, how sad. What a sad so transition. Sad. Oh, what the hell, man? <laughs> Popular Science magazine, I know. This is so sad. I mean, this is like burying it's bullshit. your... It's bullshit is what it is. This is like burying your great, 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 great uncle. Which is something <laughs> I know we've all had to do. 1870s, right? Yeah, right. That's right. 151 <laughs> years... Popular science will no longer offer a magazine. Mm, okay, first and foremost, 151 years of, of a name brand product. That's impressive. And it's a testimony to withstanding all that has happened on the planet since the year 1872. Hello, President Grant. <laughs> oh, and I went to the wiki page today for it. It is already updated popular science with the term was... Popular oh, science. Geez. Was. Oh, Oh, no. Gosh. <laughs> uh, over, its ter- over that time, oh, boy, 58 individual journalism awards during, all, during those years. Obviously, most of them in the 20th century and, and 21st. 30 la- published in 30 languages, distributed when it was distributed as a magazine to at least 45 countries, but probably more. Uh, Kathy Hebert, who's the communication directors for Pop Size owner, owner uh, company called recurrent ventures she said we believe that the content strategy has to evolve beyond the digital magazine product a combination of its news team along with commerce video and other initiatives will produce content that naturally aligns with pop size mission it's a phenomenal brand and as consumer trends shift we must prioritize investment in new formats so for the first 144 years you had you had this magazine which was published on a monthly basis then in January 2016, you know, time kind of started to catch up with it. It switched to a bi-monthly schedule. And then in 2018, it became a quarterly publication. You know, I didn't even know about it, this stuff. It happened so fast. And then and they, they were done printing physical copies all together after 2020. So in 2021, it went to being an all-digital issue. But now they've, uh, they've, shuttered, they've shuttered it. So that that's why whenever I looked for it, I was like, oh, there's Popular Mechanics. Where the hell's Popular Science? I uh, know. Now I know. Now I know why, but now yep. it's too late. Yep, and that's it. Now the pop, they're not they're not you know, the, the pop side brand continues, but as they said, it's just going to do other things other than a magazine, an online magazine, mm-hmm. right? So that said, though, Evan, I read that that it says that Pop Sci will continue to offer articles on its website along with its Pop Sci Plus subscription. What is I'm not even sure what that means though. Uh-huh. Do you, do you, yeah. You oh yeah, you have it? to be a subscriber online. So uh but so your membership effectively now, your subscription, you no longer get the digital magazine. It's access to exclusive content on popsci.com and as you said, Bob, the magazine's extensive archives. But you know what you can also um and I and I found them uh that there are a lot of the magazine archives are available online over at what Google Books and uh, the Internet Archive has uh, several of the old many many of the older issues. So I, I was actually yeah looking around those those sites today at some of the old magazines. I remember some of these magazine covers. Boy, when I was you know reading them. Yep. So I'm an old man, right? An old, old, mm-hmm. old cranky man. Uh, in my in my <laughs> mid fifties, all right. I've noticed. But in the seventies, when I was when I was a spry young lad, just growing up, you know, you know, seven, eight, nine, nine years old. Remember, guys, you you go to the pharmacy or the drugstore, as they, as they used to say it, and the magazine rack was huge. You know, you you would you would go in there and spend you know an hour just looking through stuff. And Popsi, there oh, yeah. it was always among. Like the magazines up, up up front that you would you know definitely have an eye on because they always had a cool. That was my cool go to man, even more than Popular Mechanics or even Scientific American. In a lot of cases, it was just a a nice blend of uh, accessibility and, uh, mm-hmm. and interesting articles. Check this out. So it, it right, it began in 1872, and I, I this is from the wiki. I mean, I'm going to read right from it, which I don't usually do, but this was cool. May 1872, Edward L. Yeomans created the magazine to disseminate scientific knowledge to the educated layman. Yeomans had previously worked as an editor for the weekly Appleton's Journal. Um, Appleton is a ma- major name in publishing. If you're, my, I, my wife used to work for a company uh, division called Appleton and & Lang, and that's you know the modern 
sort of incar incarnation of that, but Appleton's journal and persuaded them to publish this new journal. Early issues were mostly reprints of English periodicals. The journal became an outlet for writings and ideas of Charles Darwin, Thomas Henry Huxley, Louis Pasteur, Henry Whoa. Ward Beecher, Charles Sanders Pierce, William James, Thomas Edison, John Dewey, and James McKean Cattell. I mean, ah, if you had a time machine, you're going back to, to that era and you're you're looking through your through you know this new magazine and stuff and that's what you're and these are the things that you're reading about you know what Charles Darwin's doing what what Huxley is writing about oh my gosh Louis Pasteur's research ah crazy crazy to think about that popular science was covering that those <laughs> ideas, wow, man. you know and what year was that 87 uh, no 18, 1887 1872 is when it uh, oh 72 yes 72 Okay. Oh I don't know gosh. if you know this, Ev, but, you know, the first Nat Geo magazine mm -hmm. was 1888. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, Pop's Eye beat it by like a decade, a decade and a half. Next year, they'll no longer sell it on newsstands. This is uh, – and this is part of uh, – and, and what uh, the article where I read about this first over at The Verge uh, was, t was touching on that very point, sort of, Kara – in that, um, here's what they write. Layoffs have impacted journalists on the science beat particularly hard in recent weeks. National Geographic cut the remainder of the magazine's editorial staff this past June. Gizmodo laid off its last climate reporter. And CNBC shuttered its climate desk just last week. Mm -hmm. So there's this trend, mm -hmm. apparently, of uh, this shrinking end of, of the science journalism world it's sad and, and it even, is sad I mean, and it's part not to knock pop sci at all but you know i use a feed reader when i'm looking for articles mm -hmm. and it aggregates um all of the different you know science content from different rss's that i pull up and when i look through pop size feed oftentimes it'll be science articles interspersed with like the best black friday deals yeah now uh, you can get this thing on you know on yeah these headphones on sale it's a lot of like weird tech like promotional content. Yeah, I mean, everyone has to search for a way to survive in the new media environment. You know what I mean? Yeah, printing a magazine, you know, maybe it's just not a sustainable business model anymore. But if they put, you know, if they still publish all the same articles just like on a website, you know, on a, a web news site rather than in something in a magazine format, which is kind of archaic when you mm -hmm. think about it, that's fine. You know, articles don't have to go up every month or whatever they would be every quarter. Just every every day, you have another piece, and you know, or whatever. Well, we published uh, a quarterly, and, it turned, and then turned our efforts into a podcast. So we yeah, we made the transition. Yeah, we transitioned to a blog and a podcast. You know, to social media when that came out, and now we're on TikTok. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but whatever, it's 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 a treadmill. It's hard. It's hard to keep up, but also it's like these big brick and mortar organizations may not just be well suited you know they may not be light enough to adapt quickly to mm -hmm. you know the shifting social media environment the way people consume information I hate to say it you know but that we can't just lament what's going away we have to think about like well how do we adapt to the new world and survive and and keep good science reporting i do think it is a real serious problem though the loss of science editors yeah, at major news outlets mm -hmm. is a problem because then the quality of the science reporting takes a nosedive. Yeah, when you have we talk about this all the time when you have like the lifestyle reporter reporting on science news, it's always a disaster. You know? Yeah, it never mm -hmm. worked. Yeah, it always goes yeah. south. All right, guys, I'm going to give you just a, a quickie with Steve. Very quick follow up. You guys remember <laughs> LK99? You guys remember that? Oh, mm -hmm. it was uh, yes. room temperature yeah. or something. Total earlier. bullshit. Yeah, room temperature, superconductor, uh, uh, and and ambient pressure. That's critical. Ambient pressure, yes, room yes. temperature, superconductor. This made kind of a splash, what was it, a couple of months ago? And uh -huh. we, we, we expressed, I think, appropriate level of skepticism. Like, until this is validated, we should remain skeptical because yeah. this is a pretty big claim. This would be, it'd be awesome if it's true. But yeah, it actually took a little bit longer than I thought it was going to take because other labs were actively working at it. Well, it seems that there's been a fairly definitive debunking of the superconductivity claims. A uh, paper was published showing that, you know, this is technical, but the structural transition of copper sulfate, Cu2. Copper. Uh, <laughs> or it's, I think it's That's technically right, copper. Yeah, copper sulfide. That that was, was the um, origin of the 
the data that they were interpreting as signs of superconductivity. Like, nope, it's not superconductivity. It's just a transition phase in this molecule. There is no reason to think that there's any superconductivity happening in this LK99 alloy. So as predicted, it wouldn't replicate, and that's what happened. This is why when, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know, this, mm -hmm. this would have been a massive leap forward. Obviously, we would love for it to have been true. All the more reason to be skeptical, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you yep. really want something to be true. Um, this was like the neutrino, neutrinos going faster than light story. We kind of all knew it wasn't true when it came out. We just had to figure out why it wasn't true. This goes on the list of, uh, of anecdotes of why you need to be initially skeptical of these kinds yep. of uh, reporting. This episode is brought to you by Dragon Ball Legends, the ultimate Dragon Ball experience on your mobile device. Dragon Ball Legends features action-packed anime action RPG gameplay with Goku, Vegeta, Trunks, and all your favorite Dragon Ball characters. Summon your favorite characters from popular Dragon Ball anime series, such as Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball GT to Dragon Ball Super. Fight in real time against friendly or rival Dragon Ball players from across the globe in live PvP battles. Enter ratings matches with your favorite Dragon Ball characters and earn rating points and rewards. Unite with friends to defeat powerful foes in co-op. Dragon Ball Legends features the best anime fighting scenes on your mobile device. And now, Legends Festival is on, so you can get up to 300 free summon tickets. Are you ready? Download Dragon Ball Legends today. Available for free on both iOS and Android devices. All right, Jay, it's Who's That Noisy time. All right, guys, last week I played this noisy. That's a weird sound. There were a couple of sounds there. It was layered. Yeah, there was a few things going on there it for like, sure. It sounded like someone was whittling a piece of wood <laughs> in the back, right? <laughs> kind of that shaving almost piece to it. What was that? So Visto Tutti takes a stab at this one and says, This tune sounds like uh, it was played on a water bird. These are a kind of whistle often shaped like a bird. The whistle mm -hmm. sound sound bubbles through the water to give a bubbling, trilling sound. Unfortunately, my kid just broke the one I got him like five years ago. Oh, no. It is not a water bird, but yeah, there's a little bit of that going on there. But let's move on to the next guest. Adam Russell wrote in and said, this is the sound of an astromech droid whistling while he works. <laughs> yeah, you're always going to get me. Could With be. Star Wars references, that is incorrect. Jonathan Cook wrote in, hey, guys, longtime listener, first-time guesser. Uh, he said, we used to have a Yamaha Electone organ when i was growing up above the to the top keys console was a felt strip that you could run your finger along to make weird noises there were different switches to change the sound that was his guess he is incorrect it is not a keyboard i know exactly what he's talking about though as far as moving your finger on the thing to change the pitch and everything another guess here from brendan Getz: are these the high notes of the electronic organ used for mind control in the movie strange brew and then he, he he has a quote from the movie, that song's making him fight. Eh, yeah, do it again. Anyway, I do remember that movie. I remember enjoying it when I was young. I probably hate it now, but not correct. And I got a correct guess on this one. And this is, I always learn from who's that noisy. I said to myself, no one is going to guess this in a million years. No one's going to guess what this is. Well, somebody knew what it was. Jason Baker wrote in and said, hi, this really sounds like the locator sound that drain cameras use, the camera head broadcasts a radio signal and the detector is moved around on the surface until the location of the camera in the pipe is determined from triangulation. So what you have going on here is, this is the uh, what, what Ken Haberman wrote to me to describe this thing. The noise you are hearing is a rigid Navitrack scout locator that is used to locate parts of plumbing lines such as a boundary trap, uh, when not visible above ground. So basically, there's, there's a plumber who is holding this strange-looking device that is emitting sound, and it's able, it, it, using sound, it's able to locate pipes that are not viewable from the surface. Mm -hmm. So listen to it again, very briefly. It's an interesting sound. Essentially a form of sonar. Yeah. So thank you for that one. Um, I have a new noisy for you guys this week. 
This noisy was sent in by a listener named Andrew Furmore. <laughs> All I got to say about that one is good luck. That was Bobby, that was Bobby McFerrin, wasn't it? That is, that, <laughs> I love it when somebody sends me a noisy and it makes me crack up. That one made me laugh. Um, so if you think you know what this week's noisy is or you heard something cool, then you could email me at WTN at the skeptics dot org. A few quick things, Steve. Yeah. One, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of our patrons. Uh, without you guys, we, we really couldn't do what we're doing every week. So we really appreciate your support. If you'd like to, uh, you know, help support the SGU, all you got to do is go to patreon.com forward slash skeptics guide. And any, any donation you make is perfectly fine. We appreciate any support that you're willing to give. So please consider that. You could also join our mailing list going on the SGU homepage. We have a link there to join our mailing list. You could also give our show a rating on whatever podcast player you're using. Uh, I think Apple still has the you know, their ratings mean the most. So if you don't mind, you could go over there and give us a quick rating. That would be fantastic. So we are formally announcing uh, shows that we have coming up in April. So there is a full solar eclipse happening. Yep. Total solar eclipse. Absolutely. The total of the heart. Now, this is happening <laughs> April. The eclipse is on April 8th. Yes. That's a Monday. So we're flying into Dallas because we are determined that Bob's bad luck with making clouds appear when anything astronomical is happening. <laughs> yeah. We don't think that Bob's powers will work in Dallas. We're going to Dallas for the viewing. So we're going to be doing two shows. We're going to be so doing naive. an extravaganza with George Robb. Yeah. That'll be happening on Saturday the 6th. And then we are going to have a private recording of the SGU, mm -hmm. like we call that, a, this is a private show plus because we'll be doing other stuff as well as recording the show. And that will be happening on Sunday the 7th. All of the information that you need for those two shows will be on the website. So you can go there and check it out. Also, a quick reminder, you can join us for our live streaming. We live stream on TikTok on Wednesdays starting at 1 p.m. And on, I think, a lot of things, you know, YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. Eastern time. time, yes. Yeah. Yes, Eastern, Eastern time. time. Always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this you <laughs> operates on Eastern time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jay. We're going to just do one email today. This one's interesting. Uh, so Ryan from the Cayman Islands, not sure if we've had an email from the Cayman Islands before. He writes, my friend suggested I submit this story. I've been using GPT, just chat GPT, for a great deal of software and also family health work. I'm pretty much using it as a personal physician. I understand the risks, but I'm pretty good at co corroborating its responses with other research. Toddler banged his head yesterday. I, I took a photo of it into GPT and asked it how it looked. It was pretty helpful. Uh, baby was right sick last week, and it helped us make a decision on care at night. Cheers. So what do you guys think about using ChatGPT for, your, for medical advice? I mean, at this point, I would say don't do it because it wasn't specifically trained to do that specific thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes mistakes. Chat GPT gives false information. What do the rest of you guys think? Uh, potentially as a, as a starting place, maybe. But definitely yeah, I mean, make is it, it be all end all. I guess like a good question would be, how does it compare to WebMD? <laughs> but that's like keeping yeah. the bar pretty low, you know? So like, yeah, don't replace your doctor with Chat GPT. Yeah, it seems like there are other better tools you can access rather than this one what well, what like, evan what better tool yeah well like kara said uh or the uh, like your actual physician there are and there are so many other uh what online uh, there are online physicians and and me and medical professionals that you can that you can access right as opposed yeah but as I, a I think i was trying to make the point that webmd and chat gpt are probably like chat gpt might be better than webmd at this point oh interesting really yeah but webmd sucks we have oh. some data <laughs> okay okay <laughs> So there was a study that came out in April of 2023 comparing re responses to medical inquiries. These are questions that people posted online, healthcare questions. ChatGPT compared to actual physicians answering the same questions, right? So there are websites you can go to wow. where you actually have certified physicians. You know, they've been, they, they've been verified that they're actually physicians answering questions. So they took the questions from the site and then compared Chat, ChatGPT's answer with 
the answer given by physicians, and they gave it to a independent panel of physicians to rate them. And ChatGPT was significantly better than actual physicians <laughs> in answering the questions. Be, they were rated as more empathetic and that their answers were better quality in terms of the, <laughs> the medical advice on average than the answers from, from the physicians who were giving online answers. So that's when interesting. When you say on average, though, here's, here's an important question. Were some of them horrible? No. The, oh, the, okay. left, the left tail was better than the left tail of the physicians. Amazing. Um, if you look at the What's distribution of physicians? answers. <laughs> I know, right? Well, that's a, that's a good question. But so the thing is. Or how good is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is <laughs> pretty damn good. ChatGPT, you know, it's, we said it could pass the medical board exams. You oh, know? yeah. It could pass some specialty exams. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does. You know, it's kind of yeah. you know, close to the line there. Legal bar the fact exams. is the, the, the power of ChatGPT is that it has access to a lot of information. And it, it, yes, it could make stuff up. That's a big problem. But for, for frequent questions like this, it actually does a pretty good job. Now, before this, I opened up my ChatGPT. And I asked it a bunch of medical questions. I pretended to be a patient. I said, hey, I have these symptoms. What should I do? And oh, cool. it got everyone right. It basically, hmm. I even tried to throw it a few curveballs, and its advice was pretty spot on. What happens if you say wow. something like, Surprise. ChatGPT, I have a cough, but I am distrustful of Western medicine. Like, is it going to spew pseudoscience at you if you, like, frame it right? It, it, I've tried doing that, too, and it does say... While this is, you know, not generally accepted by the, you know, mainstream oh. medicine, some people think this, you know. Oh, That's wow. interesting. So it still caveats it. That's nice. So this is what I think. So first of all, you're right, though. You should not use this instead of a physician. <laughs> right. Right. And also, the first thing ChatGPT says every time I ask it a question, it says, I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. You should consult your healthcare professional. That's oh, wow. sort of, that's boilerplate. But then it says, but with what you're saying, you may have this. This could potentially be a serious medical problem. This is something you should go to the emergency room for. Or this is something like these medications have been shown to be effective, but you should consult with your physician about that. And then basic health advice, like stay hydrated and, you know, whatever. Right. So, it, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's actually pretty good. Uh, here's the thing. It what we don't good. have, we don't have a study that says what are the outcomes of people relying on ChatGPT. I don't, I have not seen that. Right? Are that people study. less or more likely to see yeah, help? Or exactly, they, yeah. and that's really what we would need to see in order to answer this question. Mm. But we also have to think: what are these going to? What What would these people do if they didn't have ChatGPT? Would they go right to a physician? No, they do probably WebMD. Probably not. They would do WebMD, and this is better than WebMD. This is probably better than, uh, than other online sources. Yeah, because on WebMD, it doesn't matter what your symptoms are. You're dying of cancer. Or they or <laughs> they'd listen to their friends or whatever, or they would right. go with what they think they know. Right. So the, I think the knowledge that ChatGPT is going to provide people who are going there to look for medical information is probably 100 times better than what they have without it. And it's probably better than other online sources. It's still you need the physician to put it all together and to make individual decisions and blah, blah, blah. You can't replace your physician. But as an online resource of health information, it's actually pretty damn good. From the beginning, early days of the Internet, it's mostly been used for people seeking health care information. Really? That's like oh, the that's number one use of, of the web, of the World huh. Wide Web. And so it's not like people were not doing it before, you know, so... It, this is at least a, a bump up in the quality of the information that people are getting. Wow. But, but I agree, That's... though, that because this is the case, I think these tech companies should specifically train them on reliable healthcare sources of information mm -hmm. because they know people are going to be using it for this. And I, I could see, you know, you mentioned before, Evan, like physicians, sort of like telehealth opportunities. We've got like Teladoc and all of these different sort of online healthcare companies and enterprise software that's happening. I could see this type of AI being used as a decision tree for these companies. Like a you know what I mean? Like they, almost, no, no, no. Like they, they put it into their own native software. So when somebody yeah. calls and says, I think I have a yeast infection, they go through the AI first and then they see the doctor. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the AI's already kind of done a lot of the work. It's, and the doctor yeah. can just kind of look at what the AI spit out to either confirm or deny. I could see that being really beneficial because 
we know that our health care system is pretty bloated and that we're, we have a bad paperwork problem in our health care system. Documentation mm-hmm. is problematic and patients have to repeat the same thing 50 times. And it would be really, really nice to see this like more streamlined history taking yeah. and more streamlined decision trees within healthcare. Mm-hmm. And I think as we move to online and we move to paperless healthcare, this is a great tool. Yeah, it's a great tool. It's also great for physicians. I use it. Like I will yeah. type in a bunch of symptoms or like, has there been any recent research on this? Right. Of course, it's not up to date enough to rely on that. So I also have to go into like PubMed and whatever, but it's still another source of information that might pull something up that I previously was not aware of or that I forgot about or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just a good tool for, for experts to use. Because the, the thing about computers that are better than people is computers are consistent. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They're consistent and they can be thorough. Like they'll give you the same answer every time, whereas people can forget stuff, you know? Mm. Um, so it's a good complementary, I think, strengths and weaknesses with an actual person physician. Again, your knee jerk is like, don't rely on that for medical information, but actually it's not a bad yeah. idea when you really think about it. It's probably, I'm pleasantly surprised. I suspect it would improve outcomes. For yeah, people. I would think so. Because, yeah, it's information and most people probably don't have it, mm-hmm. would otherwise not have it. All right, let's go on with science or fiction. It's time for science or fiction. Each week I come up with three science news items, four facts, two real and one fake. And then I challenge my panel of expert skeptics to sniff out the fake. We have a theme this week. The theme is mushrooms. <laughs> mushrooms. You guys ready? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Item number one. Evidence shows that many mushroom species will increase their growth after a lightning strike with shiitake crop yield doubling. Item number two, three popular supermarket mushrooms, cremini, button, and portobello, are all the exact same species. And item number three, although originally classified as plants, the kingdom of fungi is genetically closest to the kingdom of protista. Evan, go first. Okay, number one. Evidence shows that many mushroom species will increase their growth after a lightning strike with shiitake crop yield doubling. Oh, boy. That's interesting. So that's a catalyst. Mm-hmm. Yes, left? Huh? Mm. Tying it all together, right? Lightning I'm not strike? sure if that would technically be a catalyst. No. No? I don't think it's no. I right, hear well, it says metaphorically, yes. Technically, no. I'll okay, that. so that one's science, uh, based on that answer. Then the three yeah. popular <laughs> supermarket mushrooms. Uh, they're all the exact same species. That maybe, I don't know. I don't know enough about speciation of mushrooms. But I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. That kind of leaves the last one here. Fungi is genetically closest to the kingdom of Protista. Can I get a Protista example? Paramecium. Paramecium, yeah. Okay. Amoeba. Genetic. They are they are eukaryotic but single celled creatures. I'll say that the protista it is not genetically closest to it. So I'll say that one's the fiction. Okay, Bob. Let's start with two here. So mushrooms, cremini, and portobello. I mean, I haven't heard of some of these. It wouldn't surprise me if they're the exact same thing. There's other examples of uh of food items that have multiple multiple names. So that wouldn't surprise me, although I'm not very familiar with it. I don't like eating mushrooms, although I love mushrooms. I don't like eating them, so I'm not sure. The mm. third one, <laughs> closest to the kingdom of Protista, I think, uh, God, I used to know this. I'm going to go with that one, uh, which means that um, many mushrooms will have a spike in growth after being struck by lightning. I'm not buying that. I'm calling that fiction. Okay, Kara. I think I agree with the guys about the different types. I, I don't remember what creminis look like. Buttons are, eh. I mean, they're similar in shape. But yeah, I mean, I could see that. Like three like three of the same species, but maybe like grown under different conditions to like yeah, bring yeah. out different features or something. Yeah, I could definitely see that. This the, the last one bugs me a little bit because it's like, okay, although originally classified as plants, maybe they were originally, who knows? We've been wrong a lot. The kingdom of fungi is genetically closest to the kingdom of protus well they're not genetically close because they're a different kingdom 
closest meaning than other kingdoms. Okay, but cl- kingdoms are so far from each other. So, like, for me, it's like, it, it just seems, okay, maybe they are slightly cl- I don't know. I just don't see them being enough closer to be considered, like, kingdoms are all really far apart by definition. So that one bothers me for some reason. Even though, yes, striking the ground with lightning and then mushrooms growing faster also is kind of bothersome. But lightning has a lot of energy in it. And mushrooms, I don't know, don't they grow on dead shit? Like, they don't photosynthesize. Maybe it increases their energy. I don't really understand how mushrooms grow, actually. Something about the mycelium and spores, and then the entire world catches cordyceps, and then they come back to life. And then we have to find the blood that's untainted in a little girl. Clickers, (laughs) clickers! I think I'm going to go with Evan on this and say that the protist one is the fiction, because I, I can make a case for the lightning maybe uh, i feel pres- okay, i feel pressure uh, maybe <laughs> all right so the first one is talking about uh the mushrooms being stimulated by electricity that's interesting i mean christ i've never heard anything about that before in my life but i mean <laughs> it's this one i could see going both ways i mean uh whatever okay let's just all right i'll say that one's science the second one, uh, supermarket mushrooms. Uh, I absolutely think that those three mushrooms are the same goddamn mushroom. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's all marketing. It's all bullshit. I mean, you know, I just saw I just saw a, a news program talk about how, you know, all the expensive fish that you buy in restaurants, like 30 percent of restaurants completely lie and give you like really crappy, oh, super yeah. cheap fish. So I, I just don't trust like That's food marketing. At also, all. you know, they changed the name to make them more palatable. I, I always bring oh, this yeah. up on the show. But do you remember what a Chilean sea bass is actually called? Yeah, it's a it's a mugfish or something. Right? <laughs> it's a Patagonian toothfish. Toothfish, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're nasty. Nobody uh, wants to eat yum. that. But sea bass I almost, I almost puked in my mouth when somebody <laughs> said to me, are you making artesian bread? I'm like, <laughs> No. I am not making artesian bread because there's no such god. There's no goddamn artesian nothing. It's a it's a freaking marketing word. Artesian. Oh, all right. Yes, I make small batches. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, I'm not mass producing it. Does that make it artesian? Oh God. I don't. I, that I hate that word. I'm actually offended by that word. I just realized that I'm a goddamn snowflake. I used to yeah. like it. Artesian. Get the hell out of here. Yeah, no. All right. Anyway, I, I'm with Evan. Like, I really don't know that much about uh, the different kingdoms and the classifications. It's it's super nuanced. It's complicated. And you have to have a ton of information in your head to even kind of think your way around it. Mm. But for some reason, I think that one is the fiction um, because the other two just seem cromulent enough to say that they're science. All right. So you guys all agree on the second one. So we'll start there. Three popular supermarket mushrooms, cremini, button, and portobello, are all the exact same species. You guys all think this one is science. Do you guys have any idea what these mushrooms look like? I know, and I know what a yeah, portobello absolutely. mushroom is, and I know what a button mushroom is. I don't remember cremini. Cremini, I don't yeah. remember. Basically, cremini is a brown version of a button mushroom. Okay. The button <laughs> mushrooms are white mushrooms, like a small white mushroom. They're right. And portobello are these big, open, flat, brown mushrooms. Yeah, you can, like a portobello steak is what Yeah, Yeah, you replace exactly. like burgers with them. Yeah, yeah. they're right. good. They are good. They are all the same species. They're basically okay. the same mushroom. The only difference is Size. the cremini are baby portobello. That's it. They're just picked when they're smaller. Baby That's the only difference. Mm. And the button is an albino cremini. That's uh. all it is. Somebody had white one cropped up in their in their you know their whatever their mushroom patch, and they said, "Oh, that's interesting." They just they cultivated the that, and now it. yeah. And then these yeah. these these three mushrooms, which all all the same species, represent ninety percent of supermarket mushrooms. Jeez, random question. Ninety. Yeah, I know with like fruits and veg, sometimes obviously the the richer the color because of the pigmentation, because of the actual chlorophyll that's in the chloroplast or the different pigments. Mm-hmm. Uh, can increase like nutritive properties. Is that the case with mushrooms? Do, like, do we want to be eating like it an has albino no version? Pro- properties, right? None. Yeah, I, I guess, guess it does. Well, no, no, that's not true. Mushrooms. It has. Mu- it yeah. has vitamins. I think mushrooms have. I think they have protein yeah. in them, don't they? No, oh, you, could, you uh. could get a lot of nutrition from mushrooms. So uh. the 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 difference is that the the small ones, the cremini and the button, have a lot more water in them. 
Okay. And so they actually have a less flavor, less intense flavor, just because they're more dilute. The portobello are more flavorful because they're more they're drier. Okay. That's it. Um, the drier. That's the yeah, difference. Yeah, that's the difference. All right. Yeah, Otherwise, they're the same. It's the same mushroom. Just pick them young, pick them old. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some magnesium, calcium. I, I it does the have some stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It just oh. seems to me like like a bleached out. Food. It's not bleached out. It's, it's I know it's albino, albino. but it yeah. never produced the pigment to begin with. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. But it just seems to me that that would have like I don't know because I think of nutrition being in, uh, related to pigmentation. But that's, yeah, but in I this case, I don't think case. it is. Yeah, yeah, because they don't photosynthesize. It's a different process right. altogether. Right, right, right. Okay, let's go to number three. Although originally classified as plants, the kingdom of fungi is genetically closest to the kingdom of Protista. Oh, you're talking about on a map, these two kingdoms. Oh, <laughs> they border each Evan, other. Evan, Kara, and Jay think this one is the fiction. Bob thinks this one is science. Uh-oh. Go, Bob. I'm going to give you a little information Thank here you. before I give you the reveal. So originally, Linnaeus thought there were three kingdoms of stuff, right? Yeah. There was animal, vegetable, and mineral, and that's where that comes from. Yep. He, yeah. so he, had, he was, was wrong about a lot of shit. Animal. But right about a lot of shit. Yep, the vegetables <laughs> and the lapidium for minerals, regnum vegetabile. So and, and so basically vegetables were everything other than animals that they knew about at the time, including, you know, fungus and algae and whatever. And they didn't know about microscopic stuff, right? Yeah. Then then that evolved into three kingdoms of life. When they when they started seeing microscopic stuff. So they go, okay, we have animals, vegetables. And microscopic organisms were the three kingdoms, right? Yeah. Then it went to four when they discovered that the microscopic stuff was divided into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Mm-hmm. And then to five when they figured out that fungi were not plants mm. and that they were in their own kingdom. And then there's another stage after and that. And then when the... Domains. Well, in, in the U.S., we, di- we divide the bacteria into archaea and bacteria... Mm-hmm. In other other parts of the world, they combine those into the Monera. Have you heard that, Bob? The oh, no. Kingdom I've of heard Monera. of Monera, but I didn't know. I Monera is just bacteria and archaea spread. together, yeah. And then, and then there's the, oh, the domains of life, the prokaryote and eukaryote. Mm. So the prokaryotes are the Monera, archaea and bacteria. Eukaryotes are the protista, plants, fungi, animals. So the question is, when did the fungi branch off? from the eukaryotes? Was it closer to the branching point of the protists or was it closer to plants or closer to animals? Ah, That's yeah. the question. Yep, right? yep, it's all, yep. It doesn't matter how close or far they are, Kara. It's all relative. Like we're just, what, what was the branching from order? A what was the branching yeah, order? Perspective. This one is the fiction. It is the fiction. Okay. So if it's not the closest animals to the then? protista, it's animals. They're yeah, actually yeah, closer yeah, yeah. to yeah, animals. Than they are to plants, even though they were originally classified as plants because they look kind of like plants. But um, they're closer to animals. First of all, they don't photosynthesize, right? right? They have chitin in their uh, cell walls, which no plants do, but animals Mm -hmm. can. Well, animals don't have cell walls. Oh, yeah, membranes. You're right. Yeah, it's membranes. Yeah, that's the Um, biggest difference. And they they break down stuff for food, right? Even though they they right, break yeah. down dead break stuff down. as yeah they they catabolize. It's interesting, yeah. like and they breathe yeah. and they breathe uh, air, you know. So yeah, they're they're uh, well, more so similar plants. to plants animals. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're fast metabolically, yeah, than they yeah. are to to plants. Plants are just uh, way more complex. <laughs> yeah, like plants are so cool compared to animals. They do all sorts of cool shit. So and fungi are incredibly uh, complicated. I'll throw out some other facts. Archaea are the coolest of all. Yeah. So Their there are some people who think that. Yeah. Off the hook. All right. Which means that evidence shows that many mushroom species will increase their growth after a lightning strike with shiitake crop yield doubling is science. Very interesting. Steve, I thought I picked that one because I thought you perverted a real science news item that I read. Oh, <laughs> I hate it when that, that happens. Oh, I hate totally, it when that happens. Oh, the it trap. totally <laughs> sucked me in. It's like, damn it. So oh, that's the worst. Th- th- it was observed that some mushrooms would have a crop spurt, a growth spurt after a lightning strike. And so that was put to the test in Japan. And what they did was they said, okay, so if the lightning hits 
a mushroom, it's going to kill it, right? It's going to kill it. They, there's so much energy. But what about the deeper parts? Because you know that mushrooms deeper, live deeper. underground. It's a massive underground mycelium network. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. mushrooms are just the fruits of this massive underground organism. In fact, the largest organism on Earth is a mushroom. Uh, and also probably the oldest. So they said maybe the, you know, the, the most of that mushroom is going to get a survivable shock of electricity, right? M- much weaker, uh, but, but significant amount of electricity. What happens? So they simulated that by giving, you know, a, a mycelium network, a, a, you know, a very brief jolt of electricity, but not enough to kill it outright, you know? And it transported to the end of the, of the galaxy? <laughs> They're working on that, but it just grew a little bit. What happened was for eighty <laughs> percent of the species, eighty percent of the species tested, they it increased their growth rate, and the um, shiitake group, the shiitake crop, their yield actually doubled. Wow! Uh, what the hell, man? Yeah. So they think that the what they think is that it, it it's a stress response of the mushrooms. Um, they say, oh, we just took a hit. We better grow and replace what we lost. And so they, they produce a lot of, they have a growth spurt. Hmm. Um, but yeah, but you could exploit that by just giving them a sublethal sort of, t- you know, tingle of electricity. And they think, oh, part of us just got zapped with a lightning bolt. We better make more. Uh, and so they, they, they metabolically increase their growth rate. Interesting. Could be exploitable for growing mushrooms for crops. They should test people for that reaction. Yeah. Yeah, don't get struck by lightning. Yeah, it's bad. Do that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so, bad. not good for the heart or brain or skin. How many mushroom species do you think there are? Four. 25. Uh, 11 and a half. Species? I don't know, yeah. like 1,500? 1,500? 1,501. You guys Considering want to that a... three, oh, like three are like everything we eat. I'd like to clarify my statement. I think there are 10,000. <laughs> 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 Would you say before? <laughs> There are eleven point five. There are for over fourteen thousand species yes. of course that are known. Two thousand one hundred of them are edible, but only okay. thirty are commercially grown. Uh, can be you know basically be grown commercially. So yeah. there's thirty commercial mushrooms, twenty one hundred edible mushrooms. Yeah, edible forage. meaning it won't poison you. Uh, yeah, right. edible yeah, meaning, and, and it. probably that it's nutritious too. Yeah, like a lot of people forage for mushrooms. It's like a common. Yeah. Thing oh, absolutely. You just, yeah. you just have to know what you're doing because there are lookalikes, right. and the yeah. deadly ones could be really deadly. Oh gosh, so, watch some yeah, YouTube videos. Yeah, just know about what that. you're doing. Yeah, yeah watch into the wild. Oh wait, those are berries. Read it. Berries are the same way. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. There's a there's lot of lookalikes. A lot of lookalikes, and you don't want to get the wrong one. Um, if you watch a, a, alone, you know, the, where people are trying to survive in the wilderness alone, like mushrooms are like half of what they eat out there because they're, they could all forage for, for mushrooms. Did you know that fungi do, were, was a dominant life, you know, life form on, on the earth, on the, you mm-hmm. know, out of the ocean um, for a period of time? They were like it. They were number one for a little while, mm-hmm. like I think yeah. like a week. A week. Like a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In, in a cosmic sense. Yeah, so a couple million yeah. years. <laughs> and they were big. They were some of them were like tree like like small trees. Ninety species of, of mushroom glow in the dark are bioluminescent. Oh. oh that's cool. Oh yeah. All right. Uh and the largest living organism in the world is called the humongous fungus. <laughs> <laughs> oh and my god, of course. <laughs> covers three point five miles, two thousand three hundred and eighty five acres. And is believed to be two thousand four hundred years old. Happy nice. birthday! And you can't eat it. It's called a honey mushroom. I think you can. It sounds nice. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds edible to Neat. me. All right. Well, good job, guys. Thanks, hey, Evan. You got a quote for us? I do. Can I do a correction first of an old quote before Always. I get to the new quote? Okay. <laughs> I was. This was. <laughs> this was brought to my attention recently. So back in episode 955, I had a quote from Jonathan Stay and Stephen Hupp from the book Investigating Clinical Psychology, in which you're talking about uh, it's the age of health misinformation. You can go back and read the quote. Well, I got a email from Jonathan, uh, from Stephen Hupp, <laughs> mm-hmm. actually, which is always kind of cool when somebody, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about on the show actually writes us back. 
And he's just he fishing for another plug. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Steven's, laughs> like we've also written books with him before. <laughs> Stephen's a fan of our show, which is awesome, and delighted we quoted from the book, but wanted to let me know that the quote was actually from the forward uh, of the oh, book. Oh, so he written, didn't write it. No, it was written by <laughs> Timothy Caulfield, who we also oh, cool. very yes, much appreciate and, and love. Yep. So, so that's a Timothy Caulfield quote instead of uh, being attributed to Jonathan Stay. And Stephen Hub. So, Stephen, thanks for writing, and I do appreciate oh, it's that. It's a humble, yeah, humble write-in. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I'm so Credit kind. Credits so, too. So super yeah. kind, and uh, you know, very, uh, very appreciative of us mentioning it. So cool. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Now, on to this week's quote, which hopefully I won't don't screw this one up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> hopefully, I won't have to do that. Did you right? double check it? I did. Yes, and I double checked okay. it to make sure, first of all, that we didn't use it before. Uh, which we haven't, and I went back, but but when I did plug it in to my email, I take what I do. Part of my checking, you know, we have an online. There, there's an online resource about uh, the quotes that we've done for like the first 500 episodes or so, and then it, it, it tailed off after that. It didn't populate anymore. But also, I, I I run the quote through my email to see if it's come up before, and it you know it'll ah. filter out all the emails going back 15 years. Basically, I've got. Um, to see if it's a if it's a quote that we've used before, and it, it it didn't come up, but it came up as a suggestion from a listener back in 2015, which I obviously missed picking up. But uh, Carlo just says the West Coast, West Coast of the United States. So Carlo, back in 2015, from the West Coast of the United States, suggested this quote, and I appreciate it. Skepticism, the mark, and even the pose of the educated mind. Said by John Dewey. That's cool. American philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer. I put that into chat GPT. I said, who said? And then the quote, and it said John Dewey. Cool. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Mark, it said Mark Twain. No. <laughs> <laughs> Evan, did you, say, did you say, is it supposed to be pose or prose? No, P-O-S-E. Yeah, like the pose, like the stance. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Just check. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. Very nice. Yep, I agree. Uh, yeah. Scientific skepticism. Yeah, it's all about critical thinking. Well, thank you all for joining me this week. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 